Thanks very much. And it's, it's wonderful to be here at the uh, cream filling of a Twinkie uh, to start off this morning. Well, good morning, everyone. And I'm really excited to tell you some of the stories of what we've learned over the 100 years that we've existed. This year is the centennial for the foundation. And we've spent a lot of time just going through our robust archives to understand what works and what actually drives uh, innovation. And I'd like to start with a breakthrough story from over 100 years ago. So one of the earliest programs of the Rockefeller Foundation in the early 1900s had to do with improving education. And in particular, there was a focus of improving public education in the South. Now, when these folks spent some time in classrooms, like the one shown here, they observed that student achievement was actually correlated with student health. So they started to look at the problem of student health. And one of the things they found was that hookworm disease was quite prevalent. In fact, there were infection rates of up to 60% in some of the local counties in which they were working. Now, hookworm is a pretty nasty disease. It can make people feel very lethargic and unresponsive. In fact, at the time, it was referred to as the germ of laziness. And it causes anemia, digestive problems, and stunted growth. Now, fortunately, there actually was a medical cure for this disease. And the trustees of the foundation at the time knew that. But the innovation, the solution, wasn't just the cure itself. What was the breakthrough was how they went about implementing the cure and how they connected to different people to make it happen. So in 1910, they launched a campaign to eradicate hookworm. It was a very ambitious goal, but they were committed to doing it. And they went down with a three-pronged approach. First, they mapped out the disease to really understand where it was. Second, they had mobile dispensaries where they handed out the cure. And third, and most importantly, they had campaigns for local education to help people learn more about this and prevent the disease and reinfection. Now, at first, the people in the South were a little cynical and, in fact, resistant of this. You remember, this wasn't that long after the Civil War, and having a bunch of Northerners come down to cure laziness wasn't the most popular idea. But they really engaged the critics through the local press. They had very innovative demonstrations and illustrated lectures. And they took advantage of this very newfangled thing called film and created some of the very first movies and public service announcements. And that's really the most important point about this whole story, was how they connected their innovation of a medical cure with the local context in which they were working. And through their work, they created a lots of powerful networks. They connected local doctors with school officials, with county health boards. And those connections remained after they were done and went on to continue to improve society in the South. So this story is really one about this breakthrough story, because they essentially eradicated hookworm in five years. This story is really about the connections that they made. And that's what I want to talk about today, both the connections between ideas, how public health could actually be connected to improving student achievements, and also the connection between people, the experts in the North who had the medical cure and the local school officials and communities in the South who really needed it and had to implement it. So as I mentioned, we're having our centennial year this year. It's been 100 years that we've been around. And when we look at our successes and also our failures, what we find to be one of the most important determinants is whether we made the right connections or not. If we had a problem or spotted a problem, were we connected to the people with the best ideas? And also, were the people who had the best ideas, were they able to connect to the people who had the resources to help solve the problem? So I want to start talking about connections between people, first of all. So a young Albert Einstein, um, way back in the early 1900s, decided to write to John D. Rockefeller's seniors top lieutenant and asked him for $500 to fund some research. And John D. Rockefeller Sr. said, well, let's give him $1,000. He may be on to something. And on the left side of this picture, you'll see the check, the first installment. Now, that doesn't happen that much anymore. Um, but it's a good example of just how sometimes lucky connections can happen and results can come from that. And that's not something that we can ignore. Now, another approach to connect to people is to be much more systematic with your approach and diligent in looking and researching who you want to connect with. On the right side is a picture of Warren Weaver. He was the director of the National, uh, Natural Sciences Division at the Rockefeller Foundation for many years. And he was legendary for helping create the field of molecular biology and artificial intelligence as well. 
Now, when he thought about investing in a new area, he was very rigorous about meeting the people, talking to references, visiting the labs, and then he would make his decision. So there's these two approaches, being lucky and being systematic. And today, with modern communication technology, you can actually be both. You can reach out to everyone, and crowdsourcing is one of those uh, recent approaches that helps you, if you have a question, ask everyone. So I'll return to this cartoon in just a moment. So Innocentive is one of the pioneers in crowdsourcing, and they started in the private sector, where they created a community of engineers and scientists who was a crowd that they could pose questions to on behalf of pharmaceutical companies <laughs> that were trying to solve one of the final problems in their R&D pathways. And we worked with Innocentive to bring their approach over to the social sector. And it seemed to work fairly well. In one example, a US diplomat living in Texas had created a low-cost solar-powered flashlight to help people and communities who couldn't afford light. But he wanted to upgrade that and make it into a lamp so that it could light up an entire room. And he was just running into some design problems about how to do that. So he posed the question to Innocentive's community. And it turned out that an engineer in New Zealand had the answer. A year later, they were manufacturing these lamps in China. And they were being used to light up rooms in sub-Saharan Africa. So what's happened now is you can decouple the people who are posing the problem and the people who are working on the solution. And when you can decouple those and when you can make the right connections, it opens up lots of possibilities, which is essentially what this cartoon is about. So that's, that's a story about connecting to different people. And, and what really makes that happen is the posing of a problem. And that's the really important theme here, which is there's a real relationship between posing a problem, that being a frame of enabling different kinds of connections to spark new solutions and new innovations. So what we just talked about was about connections between people. And now I want to take a moment to talk about something that's a little harder, which is making connections across disciplines and how do you connect between communities of people. Little Sun, which is shown right here, it's the solar-powered lamp with the yellow sun design around it, was created by a collaboration between an artist and an engineer. And what they wanted to do was address this problem of electrification and people without light. There's 1.5 billion people who live without light and access to electricity, and for them, light is a luxury. But what they wanted to do was to make something that people would feel good about buying. So instead of just focusing on the functional benefits, they realized that people purchase things, even in the poorest villages, because they see an emotional connection to it. So they worked to create this light. And what's interesting about it is they first started off with a very modernist, clean-cut design. But when they spent time in the local communities in which they wanted to sell this light, they observed all the colorful fashions and art forms that those folks had, and they tapped into that energy and incorporated it into this design. Now, not only did they connect between art and engineering, but they also connected to the business model and business system that was necessary to distribute these solar lights. So what they did is they helped distributors and they helped retailers sell Little Sun. And they supported them so that each of these businesses could become profitable and grow and create the jobs that are so desperately necessary in these communities. So the root of this, though, was still a lucky connection between an artist and an engineer. And it sometimes takes a lot of energy to collaborate across disciplines. There are ways, however, to be more systematic in your approach to connecting across disciplines. Design with the other 90% cities was an exhibit that we supported at the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, where what they featured were 60 projects that addressed an important problem that we're seeing around the world. As more rural migrants move into cities, they settle in informal settlements, or slums. And slums are often overcrowded with poor health conditions, and they don't provide basic services like clean water or sanitation. However, slums are also great sources of entrepreneurial energy, creativity, and social connection. So among these 60 projects, there was one project called Urban Typhoon Workshop. And what this was about was bringing together artists, architects, engineers, local government planners, and local communities to identify the vulnerabilities that they were facing in their slums, particularly to climate events, and to gin up some ideas 
and innovations that could then be used by local governments and municipalities. And this was a structured process that brought together different people who wouldn't collaborate normally and between which there was often large power dynamics so that they could work together and connect their ideas to come up with some breakthrough ideas. And we know that this is very important. Uh, we just recently saw a few weeks ago how a cyclone had hit Orissa in northern India. And what's remarkable is that the innovations that the Indian government put in place around early detection and early warning helped them evacuate a million people. And the death toll is somewhere in the low double digits, which is remarkable, considering that in 1999, a similar storm hit the similar area and over 10,000 people died. So it just points to how Im impactful these innovations can be uh, when they're thought about locally and put in place. Now, where there's innovation needed, however, beyond the early warning and detection is in the response and uh, the recovery and rebuilding, rather. And that is still a work in progress, certainly in India. And for those who live around this area, as we're coming on the one year anniversary of Hurricane Sandy, we all recognize that we need a lot of innovation in that area as well. So that's a little bit of a story about how you can have lucky connections between disciplines with Albert Einstein um, and, and a more systematic approach with Warren Weaver and also with Little Son here uh, as well. So now what I want to talk about is a little, something a little bit different. But instead of the connections between the people, it's the connections between the ideas. Now I want to tell a story about how you can spot new connections when you zoom out and look at the problem in the context of the system in which the problem exists. This is a story about hearing aids in India. Hearing trouble is something that people experience pretty widespread. It's more widespread than you think. About 400 million people, uh, experts estimate, have some form of hearing loss. And particularly poor, vulnerable people, this really impacts their lives. Um, and it's hard for them sometimes to lead productive social lives as a result. So there's a social entrepreneur and an entrepreneur group that came up with a low-cost protocol to fit low-cost hearing aids for poor people that they could easily afford. And the research and the planning and the design all looked wonderful. But when they went out into the field, it just wasn't working. The adoption rates were actually quite low. So they took a step back and looked at the whole social system. They didn't just think about the protocol of putting hearing aids into people's ears, but really what was going on. And using user-centered design thinking, what they identified was that people just didn't respect the lab technicians or think that they had the credibility or authority. So what they did is they gave the lab technicians white jackets. And when they did that, the adoption rates shot up. So this is about how when you take a broader view of the problem and what system it sits in and think about all the factors, you can connect different ideas to come up with breakthroughs. And in this case, connecting white jackets to hearing aids. I want to return to the problem of rural electrification for a moment and talk about another form of connections. So what I just described was how, if you take a different view of the problem, you can spot some connections. But it's also possible to take a different view of two existing solutions and come up with new connections. So this slide has lots of statistics about the problem of rural electrification. Suffice it to say that it's fairly widespread and it deeply impacts people's lives. And there's lots of efforts to solve it. None of them have really gained traction. And we're really excited about something that we've been working on for a couple of years. So let me describe two solutions that are in place. One solution is coming actually from something pretty unrelated. A big phenomenon in India is the penetration of mobile phones across the country, and in particular in rural areas. So they're putting up about 10,000 cell phone towers every month, and many of them now are increasingly going to rural areas. Because they're not connected to the electrical grid, they have to use distributed power sources, in most cases, diesel generators. Now, diesel is expensive, and it's not great for the climate. So one solution is to replace those diesel generators with renewable energy sources, solar panels in the case on the picture on the left. So that's one solution that's happening in India to solve a problem around basically an environmental concern and an economic concern. Now, more related to the problem of rural electrification, there are new innovations in small-scale power sources, distributed power sources, that people are building and creating small microgrids to bring electricity to villages. 
and that's what's pictured on the right here, which is a biomass uh, plant that provides electricity for a couple of villages. And they have studied the impact of electricity in these villages, and it dramatically improves people's lives. So here we have two solutions. One solution, which is rapidly gaining scale but doesn't directly impact lives, and another solution that's actually having some trouble scaling because it's not economically viable and needs subsidies, but is impacting people's lives. So what we've been working on is how do we combine them together? And we've created a system where you can create a slightly larger biomass plant or renewable energy powered source for electricity. You can sell it to the cell phone towers and you can sell it to the villages. And because this plant is larger than previous ones, the per unit cost of electricity goes down. And also, you can get some cross-subsidy happening because the cell phone tower companies are able to pay a higher price and therefore allowing the villagers to pay a slightly lower price. And we're very excited about this innovation and we're right now looking at the potential to scale it up to what the financing looks like, what operations look like, et cetera. And we're having some pilots already on the ground and we're seeing deep impact in people's lives. Very simple things like starting a side business or just having light and creating a new sewing machine operation and a tailoring business. So that's a story about combining two solutions together. The last story I wanna tell is about how to look at a problem fundamentally differently. How do you reframe the problem and make new connections between ideas? And this is a story from the early days of the Mercury space uh, exploration program. And one thing that the engineers were wrestling with was when they have a capsule re-entering into the atmosphere, it experiences temperatures of up to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And they needed to create a shield to protect the capsule. So they tried different materials, but no material could withstand that heat and stay together. Now, after a while, they reframed the problem and they thought, Instead of trying to protect the capsule, what if we just thought about protecting the astronaut? And when they thought in that way, they came up with what's called the ablative heat shield, which is essentially a heat shield that absorbs the heat and then disintegrates, carrying the heat away from it. So instead of trying to protect the heat shield, they basically created a heat shield that ironically disintegrates and does the opposite of what they were trying to do. And that is a very powerful way to come up with new innovations, particularly on problems where people have been stuck for a long time. It's surprising how many assumptions we build into what can't be done when we don't take the energy to try and reframe the problem. So we've talked about connections between people. We've talked about connections across disciplines, how to be lucky and systematic with both. We've talked about how to look at two solutions and reimagine how they might combine. And we've talked about how to look at problems in a very new way. And this is something that we've been doing over the course of one, our centennial year. We've had lots of events and activities where we're trying to create these new connections using these different techniques. But our centennial is coming to an end, but we don't want to stop this. So we've decided, and we're very excited, to launch a program uh, and basically create a network that will continue this in the years to come. And it's the Global Engagement Network. And what we want to do is create a platform for people to come together and connect and think about innovation using all the new techniques and all the new ideas that we have available today. We want to create a network where people can go broad and get diverse ideas, and we want to create a network where people can go deep and really hone in and work on a problem. And we're hoping that it'll allow for collaborative experimentation, rigorous debate, and also just by the very act of working on things together, which is what I imagine everyone will be doing over the next two days, create lasting relationships that build the capacity for innovation in the future. So you have the website up there. We invite you to check it out and join us. I'm sure lots of things won't work that we'll try, but it should be a pretty fun ride, and we'd love to have you along for it. So thank you very much. And I hope you have a wonderful two days coming up with the breakthroughs that our friend Kid just charged us with. Thank you.